Welcome back to Homeopathy at Home with Melissa. Hey, Melissa. Hey, Bree. I'm excited to talk about um, a not so exciting topic, but yeah. useful for sure. Yeah. Tonight we are going to be talking about whooping cough. So this topic is, I think, potentially triggering for some people or just a something that can create a lot of fear. Um, especially I think more for moms of young babies, it's something that is talked about at least when I had little babies, like this is the most dangerous thing to look out for in them. Um, so I'm hoping this will be really helpful. I know you have a lot of remedies to talk about. So should we just get started? Yeah. So, um, you know, just, just touching quickly on what the scary part of it, um, it is scary because it affects breathing. And then when you can't breathe, you can't live. And, and so, yeah, it's scary, but you know what? Um, I've seen homeopathy do much more in all the scary situations, or I, sh I guess I should say a lot of scary situations, um, do a lot better job, a much, a much better job than conventional medical practices. And my own experience with whooping cough, um, was when my oldest son, I don't know, he was either one or two. And I only, I only remember that because of where we lived at the time. Um, and I remember calling an ambulance for him in the middle of the night, mm -hmm. actually it was 11 PM. Um, and, but he had just gotten the whooping cough vaccine uh, the day or two before. And then I'm, it's 11 PM. I'm getting ready for bed. And all of a sudden he comes into me. He can't breathe. You know, he's like, Ugh. And I'm like, what? I have no idea what's happening. This was sudden out of nowhere. And um, I call an ambulance because I have zero idea what's even why my baby can't breathe, what's happening. Um, so it didn't start with he like the he, you know, he's just coughing. So anyway, we go to the hospital. And I actually, I mean, this was almost 30 years ago. So it maybe he did have a cold before and I just didn't know. I don't know, you know, like that was so long yeah. ago. All I know is that there was a suddenly there was a sudden thing that I had to to call the ambulance and he was diagnosed with whooping cough, but it wasn't until years later when I put the two things together I was like oh, when I started learning about conventional medical practices and I and I just said oh, you know what he had that vaccine right before he ended he got whooping cough so it did not prevent whooping cough for him, <laughs> yeah. um, and. So that's my experience. But what what is whooping cough? How do how would you know? And then we don't diagnose and we don't, you know, we're not suggesting you self-diagnose, but what even what is it? What's what characterizes it? So whooping cough is obviously a type of cough, but it is a long lingering cough typically. And a lot of times I think why it also can be scary is because it often starts mild um and seems just like a normal cold. So you get normal cold symptoms, it can develop into a cough. So you might have like all the cold stuff, congestion in your nose or your eyes are bothering you, um, maybe a fever and a cough. But what sets it apart, and this is obviously, again, we're not trying to prescribe anything or diagnose anything, but this is just typical progression. So like with Chandler, for you, it didn't happen that way. But um, a lot of times it is a week or two later that that cough starts to worsen and the cough sticks around and it gets really thick. A lot of thick mucus accumulates in the airways and that is what causes that uncontrollable coughing. And it can get pretty severe and have those long coughing attacks where you can't catch your breath. Um, they may vomit from just either coughing so much or not being able to breathe well. Um, they, in severe cases, if there's not a lot of oxygen, you might notice blue face, blue lips, or a red from coughing so much, extreme fatigue from not being able to breathe super well. And the whooping cough part is because when they breathe in, 
after that coughing fit, you hear like a whoop. So I've never, my kids have never had it, but I can imagine the first time I heard a croup cough, they would describe it like a seal barking. And I, I mean, I'd never heard that, but when I heard it, I knew exactly what that was. So I don't know. Did you remember hearing that? Well, so that's what I was going to say. You know, what you just described it very well could have happened that way. But again, being almost 30 years ago, I don't remember. I wasn't keeping notes back then. All what I remember was the urgency and the sudden, you know, him coming to me. I'm ready. I'm getting ready to go to bed. And he comes to me and I'm like, you know, we're, we're alone by ourselves. I mean, I was a single yeah. mom and we lived alone and, um, you know, I call an ambulance. So that's really all I remember about the, he very well could have been sick. Listen, the child was sick for the first three years of his life, constant yeah. ear infections, strep throat, antibiotics. You know, if you've ever heard any of my story, you know, it was because he was so sick and we were constantly going to the doctor and he was constantly getting antibiotics. Then he got this GI um, condition. And then that's what started me in homeopathy when I left the doctor's office and she said, oh, here, just give him this medicine indefinitely. And I was like, something doesn't feel right. So something. I went and started yeah. researching. Yeah. So well, it- I did it see though, too, not, not everybody gets that whoop. Like, so I, I think also people will wait for that big like it becoming very obvious, kind of like croup, you, it becomes kind of obvious, but sometimes it's just a cough for a long time. And you don't even notice that it's gotten so, um, junky, I guess, like in their lungs and it's obvious it's spread pretty easily, just like a lot of other things. So droplets. So if somebody coughs or sneezes, or you touch something at the store that somebody's touched, I mean, it's, spread like most coughs. And I think that's also, um, people that is something prescribed or not prescribed, but recommended during pregnancy. The DTAP, um, vaccine is encouraged because they want you, your baby to be protected from that when they're born. Infants are the most at risk because their bronchioles are so small. Um, and so that is, those are the things you hear. And I'm saying it that way because that is what you hear. And um, not that none of this is dangerous, but I'm saying that because I, my journey to homeopathy was very similar, similar in my mind. I didn't have all the stuff that you had to walk through with your oldest, but it became where I just, there was not answers for these things other than just more medication. And I had seen that not work for my family before um, with croup for my oldest, but, um, what felt really empowering to me was learning about these things. And then how, what can I do to take care of this if we were to get it at home? And that's where I started learning homeopathy. I learned other things at the time too, within like the natural realm, but luckily we've never had to deal with it. Um, now though, I would not be worried at all the freedom that comes from knowing I have, I'm equipped to take care of these things is the biggest gift. I think homeopathy has brought my life. Like I'm not scared of any of these things. So that said, yep. I agree. That's that. I I was telling my daughter the other day, um, what happened? I had like, I had a sudden stomach ache or something. And I was like, I texted, Um, I texted the family chat or just the kids and said, I'm going to lay down. Nobody wake me up. And then she was like, later, um, she was asking me what, what happened? What's wrong? And I was like, I don't know, but you know, I, I knew. And I, I, what I said to her next is, um, this is why I love homeopathy. I had the tools in my hand. I knew that, that carbo veg was going to work. It was just going to take a little bit of time. And so I didn't, I didn't have any fear or worry over that where years ago before homeopathy, I would have absolutely been worried about, oh my gosh, what's coming next. What's going to happen. What's, you know, what's going to, and no, and I don't do any of that anymore. So, um, yeah. So I, you know, I want to start with the way, um, whooping cough starts is it looks like just a cold. 
So you don't know. And so, so that's the, again, the beauty of homeopathy. You yeah. just address the symptoms that are presenting. If it looks like a cold, take cold calm. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've got a little cough, take the little remedy that, that matches the little cough. I was going to say that I want, I mean, there's literally no way for us to know without everyone getting diagnosed, but I wonder how often homeopathy takes care of these things so early on that we wouldn't, it wouldn't get to the point where it, you would even know you had whooping cough. Exactly. Exactly. So that I, it's funny that you said that. I thought that as soon as you're about to say that yep. you have a little cough, you treat the little cough. Yeah. Whatever it is, whatever yeah. the symptoms are. So I don't even have to know, um, in using homeopathy that it's called whooping cough. So we don't, I don't have to diagnose, um, you know, and you don't have to, you don't have to know it's whooping cough. So here's the remedy. Um, it's, you know, you can use the symptoms that Bree just described and, you know, what, if you're matching those symptoms, these remedies are going to match those symptoms, what, no matter what it's called. So Drosera is number one for whooping cough. And remember these remedies are spelled in the blog on my, on my blog, mm -hmm. um, on my website. And so Drosera has, you would, you know, to use, well, first of all, it's number one for whooping cough, but then you would know to use, um, Drosera if it's a loose rattly cough with yellow mucus, um, the voice is deep and hoarse. There's pain in the chest underneath the ribs. They might vomit from too much mucus and, um, worse at night, worse for singing or talking. So I really like Drosera 30 or 200. It's probably, you know, I would use one of one of those potencies, 30C or 200C. Drosera can also be taken. So let's say somebody in your family has whooping cough. The rest of everybody else in the family can take a dose of Drosera to help strengthen their immune system and help them, you know, possibly, probably not get it. Um, Ipecac. Ipecac is also a big whooping cough remedy. And um, because it's, remember, Ipecac is the nag and gag. So there, uh, did, is there a lot of gagging with whooping cough? I think, did it, you say that? Yeah. yeah, it can become that. And even vomiting because the mucus is so thick that you cough and cough and cough. Right. Until you throw up. Yep. So, yep. Vomiting from too much mucus is in Ipecac. Choking and gagging on mucus. Um, bringing up white, thick mucus. And they might even get a nosebleed with the cough. So, um, Ipecac, Drosera, and, um, oh, here's just a little note in my notes. I'll read to you. If you have an ongoing cough or you know someone who has a cough that they just can't seem to shift, then it may be the whooping cough, sometimes mm -hmm. coined the 100 day cough. And so cases are becoming increasingly common in England and Wales and blah, blah, blah. So we have homeopathy. Um, pertussin. Pertussin is a remedy. Um, pertussin 30C. And um, it is made from the potentized whooping cough. And yeah, the bacteria is Bordetella pertussis. So that's a nosode made from that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so pertussin... Um, I actually just get, um, I made a little, um, kit for a friend of mine and I gave her a little thing of pertussin and she was like, no, and she was writing down what, what each remedy was for. And I said, you'll probably never need this, but I wanted you to have it on hand in case you do need it. And, um, so pertussin 30C can, um, shorten the duration and reduce the intensity of whooping cough. You can use it alongside the best match remedy um, that we talked about already or, or one that we're going to talk about. And um, it can also be used to help strengthen your immune system if you've been exposed or, you know, if you have other people in your family or you've been, yeah, closely, closely exposed, I would say you could, you could take pertussin. I have a question about that from just knowing the principle of homeopathy, the law of similars, right? That we use similar. And there, I have seen a few cases where the no sode of that thing can be recommended to use during an outbreak or during an episode, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, just your personal thoughts on that. Like if pertussis is, or pertussin is the whooping cough potentized when you have whooping cough that doesn't match the law of similars, that's what do you call it? Isopathy? Isopathy. Yep. Yeah. And that still can work. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Isopathy works. I, isopathy is a method of homeopathy, but, or well, well, a method <laughs> of, of practice and within the homeopathy, yeah. homeopathic um, world, but that's right. Isopathy means same. So you're taking the same, just like if you were to get stung by a, um, a bee, a yeah. honeybee, and you take apis, that's isopathy. That's not even homeopathy, but it still works. Yeah. Okay. Um, I anticipated that question. So that's, have you ever given anyone else pertussin? No, I get actually, yes, I did. Um, okay. So last year there was a little whooping cough um, scare yeah. and a place that we frequent. I'm not going to give details. <laughs> and, um, and there was a family that was um, greatly affected. But then there was another family that was directly, you know, in contact with them. And so they quarantined, they did all the things that the health department told them to do. And I gave that, that family, um, pertussin. And, um, I, I believe that they did use it, you know, once maybe one dose or two doses just to, to be safe and nothing ever came up. They never got sick. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Um, okay. So I did want to ask a couple other, let's say like follow-up questions to that. Let's say, um, somebody has whooping cough and it develops into pneumonia. What are maybe some other remedies to that might not be just for whooping cough, but to have on hand for, I know we've talked about it in other podcasts, but if it develops into pneumonia or you get a fever, how do you think you would address that if it was late stage? Yeah. Um, pneumonia, antimonium tart is number one for pneumonia. Um, bladder, I think is great. Mm -hmm um, fever, you know, it could be belladonna or aconite, um, or chamomilla. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I like to think through that for people who, I mean, maybe if something changes and you need something else. Um, okay. I'll go backwards then let's say often in an acute, even though this is like a longer acute, is there, I guess, two questions. One, is there a chance maybe a person with whooping cough would need Drosera for several weeks? Or would you, I guess, I don't know if it, there's, I haven't ever had anyone I know have it. Is that something you've seen or does it usually help within a shorter period of time? I have not seen it. Um, I actually, so most of the people that I help or that come to me for help don't get diagnosed. So I don't know, you know, right. they might come to me and say, it sounds like a uh, whooping cough, but um Yes. So you can use these remedies longer term, but if it, if it's becoming more chronic like that, you might, you're not going to use it every three hours for weeks, Right. then it might be just twice per day or, but yeah, the a cough coughs can hang on and then you just keep using the remedy that's actually working. Right. If it's not working, you change. And then if it starts, if it becomes to just be a lingering thing with no end in sight, then sulfur 30 C is a great remedy to try. Yeah. Okay. And then one more question, let's say with a cough, I don't know if this is typical with homeopathy and whooping cough specifically, but let's say a lot of coughs start like really deep in the chest. And so you are, you know, you're taking Drosera Ipecac. What if they start, it changes as they, <clears throat> excuse me, as they're getting better, either turns maybe into a drier cough at the end. Mm, yeah. Would you change from that then? You, you follow you the symptoms you could. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, we know bryonia is a dry cough and then we have the whole coughs podcast that we did. So you could yeah. always go there, but as long as it's presenting like whooping cough, these are going to be your main, Stick with those. Your main remedies. Yeah. Um, Dulcamara is another one that I always forget about. I pretty much never use Dulcamara just because I forget about it. Not because it's not good. And, um, you know, you could read it. Oh, I did want to say too, for anybody who, if, you know, these remedies aren't working or you need more ideas, you've already tried these and, you know, here you are, your, your repertory. So your homeopathic repertory. Um, and so if you have the fourth edition of Dr. Murphy's meta repertory, then on page 2537, 
there is whooping cough and you'll see a lot of remedies listed <laughs> a lot. It even goes to the next page. So you'll take the top ones or you'll look for the um, sub rubrics that match and you'll take the, the top ones, read them in your Materia Medica, see which one fits the best. And um, if you need more help and more guidance and learning how to do this, come to the mentorship program. Um, these, we have coaching calls where we, where we can really practice this and get good at this. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for being here. That's whooping cough. Wow. And I hope you never, ever get it. Amen. But we have the tools if we do. Yep. Thank you. <laughs>